This week on Inside the Headset, we are featuring TJ Verneri, the wide receivers coach at Gannon University. In this episode, Coach Verneri shares how he started out as a young coach, his experience coaching different position groups at different levels, and what the AFCA 35 under 35 program means to him. If you like this podcast, be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch new episodes each week. Now, let's get inside the headset with Coach Verneri. Coach, what's going on, man? How are you? Coach Price, long time coming. Great to be on the podcast. Really excited. Yeah, no doubt, man. Well, let's dive right on into this thing. Um, when did you decide you want to be a ball coach? Yeah, honestly, for me and all of us playing as long as all of us have, it's it's really been instinctual in me that I always knew I wanted to be a coach, and I was really excited about the opportunity. It's kind of a bittersweet moment when I had my career in the injury at UConn that Coach Edsel offered me the opportunity to start my career as student assistant coach, and I always knew that was my calling once I was done playing. Just didn't know when when that was going to happen. I'm very grateful for it every single day. Yeah. So basically, that's is that was that that's your entry point. Basically, you had an injury injury while you were were a player at UConn, and uh, and Coach Edsel just said, hey, man, here's an opportunity for you to kind of continue to give to the team instead of the other. Talk a little bit about that first role that you had and, um, you know, just just what you learned in that, in that period. Yeah, being a student assistant was great. My offensive coordinator was John Dunn, who's currently the tight ends coach for the Green Bay Packers. Awesome guy. Learned a ton from him and his offense. And really it was getting my feet wet in a lot of different situations. So I handled some of the scout cards, right? I coached some of the wide out drills and stuff like that really kind of tailored my position to the younger players because something that I did as a, as a player before I became a coach was I'd always take the freshmen and, and sometimes the sophomores and we kind of have like a summer school and it jokingly became a thing that some of the vets started to join and we go over the offense and how to be a college football player and all those things. And I think that's what's helped me propel my career as a coach. <laughs> so you were, you were, uh, even before you were actually coaching, you were, you were, uh, putting on summer schools and clinics for the, that's right. for the young guys. We, okay. We called it the TJ Verneri School of Route Running. So <laughs> I like it, man. I like it. So let me, uh, you know, this question I typically ask, especially when the first break is, uh, you know, your first opportunity to kind of get your feet wet in a profession is at the place that you played at. You know, I've asked this question before, uh, but it sounds like you're already going to have a pretty good answer because you were coaching a little bit to some of the younger guys. But I was going to say, you know, you, you make this all this, this sudden transition from player to coach in, in the midst of an injury, and uh, you're still a student. You're, you're still on campus. You're still sitting in the, the dorms and, uh, you know, at lunch and in the food halls with the with the players. How did how did you kind of delineate or was it not as important being a student assistant? But how did you delineate that that new relationship you had with these guys that were your brothers you know, are still your brothers? You know what I'm saying? But, you know, were your brothers and teammates and guys you clowned around with in a locker room and made jokes with on the travel, on, you know, when you're traveling and stuff like that. How did you how did you create this new uh, relationship with these guys? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And for me, it really starts with kind of your reputation as a veteran on the team. And for me, I, I think a lot of guys would say I'm a no-nonsense guy. I'm about my business. And that kind of goes a long way for, for those younger players. If they look up to you and they know that you're about your business and learning the system and being an accountable guy, trustworthy guy, that's going to help you propel as, as a coach. And I know that did for me. And especially me being a student assistant, still technically on the team, but also now being a coach, Tailoring that transition was due to, I think, my reputation among the younger guys and, and all the veterans and all those guys. And they knew what kind of guy I was and what and that I was about my business and, and all that stuff going forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, you, you, you said, uh, you know, I had the school of route running going on for those guys. <laughs> uh, this is a question I always love to hit. I, you know, I, I would probably say I was similar to you. I probably played around a little bit more than which wasn't that serious, I guess, as a player, you know, with, with my friends and things like that. But uh, when it came to the playbook, when it came to, you know, getting better and things like that, I was a super serious player, knew the playbook front to back, all positions, and proud of myself. And, you know, for anything that I was going to lose from an athletic standpoint, I was going to make up with from a knowledge standpoint. And so I probably had this very, very disillusioned view of how much I knew about football. I had to get kind of a rude awakening once I got into the profession and, and uh, you know, got my first job and realized I didn't know very much about football at all. And, uh, you know, did you have that, you know, even though you were working in your same offense, did you have any of these, uh, you know, eye-opening experiences where you were looking at something like, dang, you know, I, I didn't, I never looked at this like that. I didn't know that. You know, what did you have any of those moments? So I would say absolutely I have. But the, the unique part about my experience is as a player, I had three offensive coordinators in, in four seasons. 
Oh, wow. So that kind of forced that, you know, and I think every coach goes through that. Your first time learning a new system, right? Just like you said. And I had three off, different offense coordinators in college that were distinctly different. Like we had an NFL guy, then we had a true like new school spread guy, and then kind of a new school NFL guy. And those are three different philosophies that's completely different verbiage and terminology and all that stuff. So I think those kind of growing pains as a player and kind of forcing yourself, hey, I don't have a choice but to learn this. It's kind of helped me become a coach in my first system and then my next system. And then you start to have a system for the system Yeah, is what I like to say. But that that experience for sure has happened to me. I just think it happened a little bit earlier because I was forced to be in that environment with three different coordinators. Yeah, but, absolutely, man. I think that's uh, I think that's something important that, you know, I, I you kind of hit it in a different way being a player, just, work, you know, having three different offensive coordinators. But I think, you know, as you get in a profession and you're young, you're on the staff for two, three, four, five years and maybe some other opportunities arise. Uh, I, I, I remember um, my second job. I, I took it only because my uh, first full-time collegiate job was with my old college head coach. So we were doing some of the same off stuff offensively. We were doing some of the same stuff from a philosophical standpoint, development standpoint. And I remember saying, this is going to be a good job. You know, it's a lower it's a lower level down, but this is going to be a good job because this is going to be a brand-new dude, brand-new offense, brand-new line of thought. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm sure as a player, you, you would rather not have that experience with three different guys, but – I mean, right. it, pays div it pays dividends early in your career to be able to start, yeah. you know, look at an offense and say, man, we always call it that smash. Well, we don't call it smash here. We call it this. <laughs> and and, and it just, tr you know, creating some of those triggers for your brain to be able to, you know, process yep. offenses and look at maybe the same concept under a new word, slightly different, um, you know, uh, techniques and things like that. Now, um, and in 2018, uh, you, you, you switch back from being a student assistant coach. Um, or, or what happens for you in 2018? You you make a transition. What, t talk to us a little bit about, about what happens there. So going from UConn to Lycoming? Yes. Yeah, so I was student assistant at UConn, and I graduated that fall. So I technically didn't do my spring semester at UConn, but I knew that I wanted the opportunity to continue to coach and, and continue to move my, my career. So I began applying to jobs and kind of talking to the guys on our staff. And an opportunity came about that one of our staffers, his head coach was Mike Clark, the head coach at Lycoming College. Shout out to him. Talked to him recently. So very always catching up with your former head coaches. But the, an opportunity came about that a wide receivers coach job was open, and I, I got the opportunity to interview. I ended up taking the job going to Division Three Lycoming College. This was a great experience. Worked with some really great people and some awesome players. Well, let's talk a little bit about the interviewing process. Um, obviously, you know, on, on this podcast, we definitely hit a lot of coaching transitions and things like that. And you know, I realize that the interviews are just a, a part of a part of this thing. Sometimes you don't you're fortunate enough to kind of just be the guy and maybe have to do some very informal stuff. But uh, right, you know, sometimes you got to go to a full blown out interview. And uh, you know, I I think about all the interviews I've been on in my career, and they were all significantly different. Um, yeah, and, and the same, and to a, to a certain degree, but uh, they all had some major differences in them. Just talk a little bit about it, your first interview, cause some of the nerves, maybe something you weren't prepared for. Just been a young coach with, uh, you know, maybe missing some experience in some areas. Yeah, no, my first interview was definitely. It's and like you said, every interview is distinct and different. And I I can honestly say that every interview I've been on has been very different from the next to the yeah. most recent. So when I went to Lycoming, I actually had a full blown interview. Now I, I went to not that I don't didn't have full blown interviews other places, but went went to the campus had the full deal. I, I was told not to dress in a necessary suit, but but look sharp. So I looked sharp and had my whole PowerPoint and everything. And all the staff members were in the room. So sometimes it happens that you have all the staffers in one room. Sometimes it's just the head coach. Sometimes it's just the coordinator. So it's been a variety of different things. But for that experience, it was everyone in the same room kind of looking at me as they go through my presentation. My And fortunate for me, Coach Clark laid out every single question he was going to ask so I can fully prepare for all those answers, how I go about it. And then there was a few little remixes at the end, which is nice to obviously as you're as you're asking someone what they think of certain concepts. But it was very organized. It, the, the times were planned out and everything. Got to see campus, got to meet all the coaches. So really fantastic experience. As they look back on my career, it was a really solid interview. And I, I really liked how it was done. Was there anything that happened in your interview that, you know, maybe maybe uh, is a good story just to tell and share or, uh, you know, maybe something you weren't prepared for? Just any surprises, anything that happened in that interview? 
Yeah, the and I I had I had had answers prepared for all those questions. I will say at the end though that I was asked a little bit about recruiting. Now, recruiting is is incredible is a great experience, obviously. But to that point, I hadn't really recruited, right. so it's difficult to talk on something that you don't have experience with. Now, we, we at, at that point in time, I have experience with route concepts, run blocking, route combinations, all that stuff. We all know and love those things. But when someone asks you kind of your plan for something you necessarily haven't done just yet, then that's certainly a unique question to me. Now, I, I did my best to prepare and draft an answer for that. But at the end of the day, if you haven't done something or have that experience, then I think then it's some, always going to be a difficult thing to kind of put into words. Yeah, and so how, how, how did you approach that when they ask the question? I mean, sometimes it's just easier to be honest and say, I don't know. Uh, sometimes, yeah. sometimes, like you said, you, you walked in there preparing. You might have had a philosophical plan that you hadn't actually right. put into action. So kind of how did you approach it? Right. So I honestly went back to some of the stuff that we talked about with the, the school route running. I kind of tailored that to that's my recruiting deal and that honesty and authenticity and, and being being – a valued member to your the guys you're recruiting and, ha- and just having a plan for those guys the same way that I had a plan for all the freshmen coming into campus that I'd show them what it was like to be a division one player or, or offensive system or what the coaches are like what the players are like the locker room so I kind of use my experience as a player to best apply that to what I would plan on doing as a prospective coach and I think that's what part of what won over those guys and ultimately helped me get the job there you go there you go. Well, now you get the job. You're there. You're what, 23, 24 years old, somewhere? I was 22. 22. 22. So you're 22, yeah. 23 for your two years there, like I'm in uh, college. What What was it like, um, you know, looking in a room? And you, you, you you potentially got a guy that's around your age, and uh, this is your first time having a room. This is your first time. You know, doing a lot of these things, you know, obviously you're knowledgeable. You, you know what's going on from a technique standpoint. But just standing in front of a room, you, you haven't done that before, um, you know, per se. I guess, you know, I guess school route running kind of kind of was a, a little bit of a practice run on it. But, you know, yeah, right. uh, guys are guys have questions and they're looking for answers. You know, coaches have questions and they're looking for answers. How did you handle that, that first and second year, you know, having your own room? Yeah, having your own room is a fantastic experience. And obviously all of us as coaches want to have our own room. But for me, like like I said, the, the TJ Vineyard School route running was a huge help for me because I can go in and I could stand in front of the room and I had already done it before, which was great. And it obviously helped me get along with those guys. Now, being a 22-year-old in a room that's full of 20 and 21-year-olds is, is certainly an experience that you have to start gaining the guy's trust. Yeah, and it exactly. starts there. It starts with trust. It starts with being accountable to yourself as well as being accountable to them and being straight up. I, I've been in plenty of rooms that have said, hey, I'm 22. So, a few jobs ago, I was the youngest guy in the room being a 25-year-old running backs coach in the CFL. And it starts with just being authentic, being honest, and understanding that you have expectations for yourself and that they should have expectations of themselves as players. And I think that kind of starts to bridge the gap between coach and player. And it's something I've always said is being a coach and player is a two-way street. It is not one way is the only way. It's a two-way street. It's give and take on both sides. So player has something, oh, hey, maybe we could do this. Okay, let's see how we can make this work. Coach has something, okay, how can we incorporate this? And being transparent in all those different things, and input is everything. Input is everything. Taking those those recommendations and allowing your your players to take those recommendations is what opens up that two-way street. And I think that's why I was I, I like to believe I was successful in achieving that in, in all the places I've been and building that trust. Absolutely, man. Well, uh, you mentioned the CFL, so – you know, after this job, you, you, you're there from 2019-2020. Uh, you get this very cool opportunity uh, to, to, to go up north and be a part of the CFL for the Calgary Stampeders. Really interested in, you know, how did the how did that job come open? I know their season is it's, it's totally different. They're, you know, our, the year is kind of inverted there. So, you know, at what point in time did this opportunity show up? How did you get on board? And uh, just really talk about the entry point. We'll talk about your time there once, once you answer that. Yeah, and and that's a that's a great question because it has to do a lot with the ASCA convention. <laughs> Good. So, but one of my college teammates, actually same recruiting class, and his jersey's right there. I don't know if you can see it, but Kirji Mayall, who's one of my closest friends and obviously a great teammate of mine, he was a first round draft pick by the Calgary Stampeders in 2019. So when I went to ASCA convention as a coach at Lycoming in 2020, I met their video coordinator, and I befriended him, and I actually met the two of their other equipment managers. And the plan was for me to go up and be a guest coach for rookie minicamp. Now, it didn't work out, obviously, with the, the pandemic and everything. 
So I kind of hit up the video coordinator and said, hey, I was supposed to meet you guys. They're waiting to get in touch with the head coach, who I ended up getting in touch with the head coach, Dave Dickinson. Shout out to those guys, Sam, Steve, what's up? And always great catching up with those guys. But I, I maintained contact with Dave for probably a year, year and a half. And then I want to say in sometime of February of 2021, he kind of told me, hey, you might have an opening. We talked a little bit more about it. We had an interview. And then and then I, I took the job in June of 2021, which was they had a shortened season in 2021. Mm-hmm. So I had to report in July. So it was really unique that I came about because of the, the convention, meeting those guys. If I didn't go to that convention, I didn't meet – our video coordinator in Ross Fallen, that never would have happened. And then I got to reunite with Hergy for a year, which was absolutely fantastic. Shout out to him. He just played the other day with the Montreal Alouettes. And the calendar is a little bit different. Now, the, the training camp in the CFL starts in May, and the season ends in the Grey Cup in late November. So it, it was a tremendous experience. It's a really great game. There's so much you can take away from the CFL and apply to 11 on 11 and vice versa. I, I think it's really a transitive game that a lot of people I think really should pay more attention to because there's a lot of unique concepts and the special teams is really creative. Some of the rules are a little bit different, but I think once you get those learned that you can start to say, Hey, this route combination could work in, in, in 11 on 11 football because in CFL 12 on 12, you know, forward motion, you have a lot of different things. So yeah. fantastic experience. But one day when I'm looking back at everything that I've done with the, the day that I truly sit down, I will say that the CFL really made me who I am in terms of my philosophy as a coach. That's awesome, man. Well, uh, I, I, I do want to go back. You know, we, we hit on that first interview, and you, you said how drastically different every, every one of them <laughs> were. So I'm definitely cu- curious on how that went down. So you already know the guy. You have an existing relationship, or at least where you're texting and talking over over yep. a year. So um, so now you go into this interview process. You at least know the guy to a certain extent. Well, how how, how right. does this interview go? Yeah, so really it was just a series of phone calls. And, and then I, I was offered the job. So completely different and completely different to the last one. Now I had not met Dave till that point in time. I didn't meet Dave till I, I reported to the job on July 2nd or whatever day it was in 2021. Okay. So obviously we, we had talked, we had a bunch of people in common between the video guy and the, the equipment guys, obviously Hergy, who's one of my closest friends and we, we talk daily, but the, I, I had not met Dave to that point in time, but really it was just a series of phone calls and you go, from the going on campus, seeing everybody, what's going on, to kind of just, hey, this is what's this is an opening. I think you're capable of doing it, and then stuff in the job. Yeah. So again, very distinct, different experiences. Yeah, and so uh, obviously every beginning, you know, kind, kind of is, is is propelled by an end. Uh, so obviously the timing is unique, and when you report it. And when you got that job, so how is that conversation going there with the with the Lycoming head coach? You know, coming in yeah. probably late in the spring and saying, "Hey, look, <laughs> we're a couple months out from the season. I'm sure you were banking on having me, but I got this opportunity. I can't pass up." You know, how yeah. how did you go approach that? You know, um, you know how how did that process go? Yeah, and I think the most important thing, and this is some this is advice that I would give for whatever my opinion is worth as a 26 year old, but the. The biggest thing for me is every single head coach that I have had, whether it's it's any head coach that I've had, if they if they decide to sit me down end of the year and talk about how I've done as a performance review, that's great. But if, if they don't have if they don't say, hey, let's formally sit down, I always go in and say, hey, give me A, B, and C you need to work on. Give me A, B, and C that you like, right? And then so I have something to kind of reflect on every single year. So opening those communication lines, in my opinion, is a huge deal because at that point in time. Coach Clark and I, we had already talked, hey, this is kind of a two-year thing, then I'm going to find my next opportunity from there. So it was approaching the kind of the end of year two. And we had talked, we said, hey, we kind of need to probably find an opportunity for you here or something like that. And it just worked out that the St. Peters were were calling me right at that two-year mark. So everything worked out for itself. But having that open dialogue with your head coach, I think, is is especially important as, as as a young coach young prospective guy in, in the profession. And, and that just allows you to say, hey, this is kind of a two-year deal. This is a one-year deal, whatever it may be for that situation. All right. So now you, you got the job in, in the CFL. You're with the Calgary St. Peter's. Your, your, your first title is Office of Assistant. Uh, then you're promoted to running backs coach and global coordinator. So just talk to us a little bit about the Office Assistant part, kind of how that, that – you know, that role worked out and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the other two. Yeah. So being off assistant was great. I was essentially, I was essentially doing all the jobs of the running backs coach. I was doing the running back drills. I was breaking down pretty much all of the films at that point. 
And I was bringing out all the film, doing plenty of scout cards, all different stuff. So my, my, I filled a lot of different, I wore a lot of different hats in that role. And honestly, when I was promoted to running back coach, I was grateful to this day for that opportunity. It was pretty much the same. So it was great for the St. Peters and, and, and how they do stuff and how they kind of promote from within in, in that process. And I think it's great because when I became the running back coach, the expectations were kind of set, right? Because it was previously what I had done as an office assistant. Now the pay was a little bit different and the title's a little bit different, but I was already prepared to be the running back coach because I was doing all those things. And I think I, that was a fantastic experience to get that, that first kind of big break of my career. And that was a huge break. And that was fantastic. The global draft coordinator role is, is, is pretty cool. Now, I, I don't know if you've heard of the NFL IPP, the International Pathway Program, but that's essentially what the global draft and the, the global prospects are in the CFL. So you're kind of, you have the opportunity to draft players that have that global designation. And so me, that was kind of like my new phase of recruiting to this point in time, because now I've had three pro seasons under my belt. You're not recruiting, but you're about, you're constantly evaluating talent. You're evaluating free agents. You're evaluating draft process, prospects. You're evaluating guys that can help you win now versus the future. But in terms of the global draft, I was evaluating college processes, college prospects that just had that kind of global designation. So it was really great to kind of go back on my player evaluation thing. I love to player evaluate, recruit, all that stuff in addition to being coach. Those two hats have to go hand in hand in order to create some continuity for your franchise. Absolutely. Well, one of my best friends actually played in the CFL for a little over a decade. Um, and I actually flew up and caught, caught – uh, a Toronto game and uh, nice. played for the Alouettes for for a long time. So I I, I was uh, even as I was a you know a collegiate coach, I would keep up with what was going on in the CFL. Kind of looked at the differences. Can't remember the, the Chicago Bears head coach, um, but he he Mark Tressman. Yeah, Tressman. Tressman is yeah. you know he's he's a phenomenal West Coast offense guy. Uh, you know and, and kind of had back, went back and forth over the, over the border between the CFL and and the professional ranks. And so. Uh, you know, obviously, seeing that crossover ball, kind of like you were mentioning earlier, it, it's certainly there, and, and there's definitely some good football, football in the CFL. So, I'd always kind of watch it, but there's some uniqueness in in regards to player roster and player management that you know I, I don't think everybody really knows about. Right, you have to have a certain yep. amount of CFL uh, Canadian players versus yep. uh, you know American players. So. I, I always thought that was super interesting because you start talking about roster management, which is a huge, you know, topic yeah. in, in collegiate football. But that is such a unique topic because there's certain American players who've been playing since they're, you know, seven years old versus Canadian players, with, you know, a, a little bit different vibe. Um, just talk to us a little bit that about that from your perspective and educate us on like what what what, what some of those rules are. Yeah. So the in the CFL, you have to start seven Canadians. Yeah. And you have to, and your ratio is locked once you once you set your lineups. Once you publish your two deep, you're lo- you're kind of locked in place, right? So you can set the ratio as offense defense three Canadians to four. So you can start three on offense and then four on defense. Now, if someone gets hurt on offense, you have to sub Canadian for Canadian, American, American for American. So you're locked into your personnel group. So you cannot really be you cannot have a huge volume of personnel groups on yeah. either side of the ball. You're kind of locked into maybe five. At the max, maybe we had a game or two with seven, but you're really locked into five. And maybe those last two groups were like specialty, specialty plays. Right. That was maybe a package of two. So you're locked into place once you have that ratio set. And once you get an injury, you have to really think about, okay, what's going on here? And you have to be very, very careful about who you substitute because it can lead into fines and other issues from the league. So you have to constantly think about your personnel in the CFL. And so, uh, with, with with that being said, um, is, especially as a global draft coordinator, what did, did you guys lean a certain way with like you know receivers are typically more from America or you know or from yeah. Canada? You know what what kind of thought process did you have to take in mind? Uh, you yeah, know, just from that the way standpoint, right? The the way that kind of the league goes, and this and this is what's unique about the CFL is every player you have from anywhere is kind of on that same calendar everyone is developmental until they're proven that they can play right where you see guys in the nfl or even in, in college a high level recruit a high draft pick in the nfl they're almost asked to play immediately you go to the cfl you're going to sit you're going to sit maybe two two years and then and learn the game and learn the system and then you'll probably play now if within those two years if you don't if you're not learning the deal and the new game and the rules and all that then you probably won't make the cut so it's really strict in that regard and then going back to your, your other question of where kind of positions fall, you're mostly going to see Canadian offensive linemen. That's for sure the number one positional 
assignment there. You'll see a, a good amount of Canadian receivers. And then on the defensive side of the ball, probably some more Canadian defensive linemen. And But overall, the offensive line dominates in terms of Canadian prospects and players. All right, I got a question that just popped in my head here. I, uh, there's a guy who actually ended up playing with my best friend I was mentioning earlier, um, who I coached at Texas A&M Commerce, and he was from Canada, but he played his uh, collegiate ball in the United States, uh, finished his career there, and then I, once again, I kind of never heard from him again. He, he wasn't in my position group and um, had a decent relationship with him, but then all of a sudden I see that he's been in the, in the CFL for like eight years at this point in time. So, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, – I'm curious, how does how, how do you mark a, a Canadian? Is it actually just where they were born, where they where they you know did everything, or is it their college ball? Was was he an American player or a, a Canadian player? How did that yeah. how does that work? Yeah, it all comes down to where where your citizenship is. Okay, so if you are a Canadian born player playing collegiate football in the United States, you are a Canadian player in the CFL because you're you have Canadian citizenship. Now, guys that go down to the states and and play college football that are that are Canadian are usually seen as that they are they're good prospects. That now they're good prospects across the board, and there's a lot there's a lot of great talent in Canada. But the the NCAA is obviously a very competitive level, and youth sports is extremely competitive as well, which is the Canadian NCAA, yeah. right? And then those those levels are, are extremely competitive and, and are really good talent pools of players, but you will see some guys that come down like my teammate Hergy who played with me in the NCAA and then go back to the CFL. So it, it's a really great opportunity for those guys to come down to the NCAA and, and have that collegiate experience. And then sometimes they go back to Canada, sometimes they go to the NFL. It just depends on how it plays out. Absolutely. But U sports is a tremendous talent pool and likewise in the NCAA. Coach, I appreciate you kind of sharing that about the CFL. Like I said, we, we've had a few coaches that have – May have, may, have, may have had a stop there in the CFL where we hadn't really ever dove into just some of those unique specifics, and there's still a lot more, like, uh, like you right. said, from from the actual playing part. And we'll, we'll, we'll have plenty to of for me to learn as well. I, I only had two years there, so yeah, plenty for me to learn. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, man. Well, we we'll, we'll uh, have to revisit on another podcast uh, again with you and, and and dive into some of the on the field rules. Now, um, you know, you you had this tremendous experience in the CFL, and now you're currently uh, it just wrapped up your first season in the USFL with the New Orleans Breakers as a tight ends coach. Uh, once again, just how did that transition happen? Uh, talk briefly about the interview, if there was one, and then we'll talk a little bit about your experience so far. Yeah, so the the big thing for me was my, my contract was up in December, so I kind of knew that I had to be looking for another opportunity and that I was going to have to move on to a different team. And so I started just hitting up guys in my network. Like I think all of us have done at, at any point in time that they kind of know they're, they're slated to move on or whatever it may be. Cause like I said, with the, the two year dialogue with coach Clark, the two year dialogue, what kind of Dave and all those different things. Right. And it came about that I had reached out to John Filippo, who was our head coach with the New Orleans breakers and said, Hey, I kind of have, I, I'm available coach right now. And, I had got his contact from a contact at Life Home, we believe it or not, when he was coaching the NFL. And from that point in time, he kind of said, Hey, I got an opening. Like, let's, let's talk next week. And we talked that Monday. It was, it was a very structured Zoom interview. It kind of showed him all the stuff that I do with Vizio and playbook drawings and stuff like that. And I believe that next day he offered me the job. So I really was a free agent coach for about a week. And it's great, crazy because I had made the 35 under 35 list and, and then kind of, accepting a new position. So I got into that mindset, hey, I'm going to introduce myself. You know, I'm a CFL coach, but now I'm in the USFL. So it's it's a really great, it was a really great opportunity coaching in the USFL. Shout out to Sage. I have his jersey right here. I have a pretty sweet jersey collection. I'm, I'm trying to start here with all of my, the guys that I've coached and play with. Yeah. So it's, it's really cool to see that stuff, that stuff grow. And Sage was a tremendous guy to work with. I'm wishing the best for him, and, and hopefully he gets an NFL call in this next week or so. He did a really fantastic job. He's a great person. And he was fun to be around every single day. Now you've uh, at this point in time you've you've coached uh, multiple position groups, uh, three to be exact, I guess. At this point in time, um, you know maybe more with with UConn, and then you actually coached in three different leagues. Now the USFL is you know obviously more traditional football, so not not hard to keep up with all that kind of stuff. I, f I really feel like this past year, um, a lot of people were watching it. I I know I've had dialogue with random people. 
you know, watching the game. So uh, seems like it ha- has a following, all that kind of stuff. You know, what is something that you learned just, you know, coaching the multiple position groups, co- coaching the multiple leagues? Um, you know, what, what, what's, what's your takeaway from these experiences thus far in your career? And it's funny, it's funny you say that because when I was the running backs coach at the St. Peters, I said, my next job is going to be tight ends. And I just had a feeling. I, I had a hunch. And it ended up being that I became a tight ends coach. So for me, I, I personally believe that I can coach any position on offense. That's just, that's my enthusiasm. That's just my personal belief. And I want to coach more positions because I think that number one, that helps myself grow and get the complete picture. But obviously it helps my experience going forward as it continues to grow yeah. in the profession. So coaching different positions is really exciting because you kind of get, hey, this is that perspective. Now this is this guy's perspective. Okay, what are their worries and concerns and what are they good at that can kind of go hand in hand with this? And then you add a third third level to it. So being a 26-year-old and coaching in, in three different leagues, like you said, three professional seasons and three different positions, it's, I, I think it's really exciting for me as a young guy to kind of see, see where this whole thing can go. And I'm just excited about the fact that I have that kind of put together knowledge and started to put together the pieces of, Hey, this is what's expected of each position that can eventually sell myself and help myself grow as a, as a coach and really as a person. So I, I'm more than glad that I've coached this many positions and, and been in this many different leagues to this point in time. Yeah. And let's, let's talk about something that, that, that I, I find interesting as I've uh, floated through the profession myself and then ultimately ended up in this role and on the phone with a lot of coaches, you know, going through the decision-making process. Um, you know, this is something I've had to consider. I'm, I've, like I said, I've heard other coaches, uh, you know, have this concern as they're going through the profession. Um, oh, man, I got an opportunity, you know, say I'm at a four-year school. I got an opportunity to go to the junior college level, but I don't want to get stuck. Or I got an opportunity to go to Division three. I don't want to get stuck. I got an opportunity to go to a HBCU, but I don't want to get stuck. CFL, you know. Uh, you guys talk about getting stuck at a at, at a level, not not necessarily as a negative way, but just as a okay, now I can only kind of do this type of job. Um, for, clearly, you you bounced through three leagues. Um, is that something that you've ever been concerned about? Is this a conversation that you've had at all? Yeah, no the the getting stuck the getting stuck question is uh, is something that I've had to grapple with for sure because you never want to be okay. This is like who I am, right? You want you want yourself to grow and you want people to see that you're multifaceted and you're capable of doing a lot of different things. You want to, you don't want, certainly don't want to get stuck in one place for doing one role. Okay. I'm only a running back guy. Oh, I'm only a receivers guy. I'm only a skill guy. Right. You don't want to have that. You don't, don't want to have that dialogue in your head. You don't want that self-talk, right? You want positive self-talk. And, and that's why I say to, to, to guys like you, coach Price and everybody, I believe I can coach any position on the offense, the offensive line, quarterbacks, whatever it may be. I'm, I'm more than confident I'm capable of doing those things. And it, it really starts with that self-talk to say, hey, I'm not going to get stuck. I'm going to do a good job here. And then whatever opportunities arise, if I choose to stay, if I choose to go, I'm going to make the best of that opportunity. And that's just been my mentality through my, I think, six seasons now as a coach. So, And that will continue to be my mentality every single day. Love it, Coach. Well, hey, before I let you go, man, I, I do appreciate the time. This has been awesome. Um, I, I want to talk about your 35 under 35 experience uh, just real quick. You know, in, in, in a short little blurb, uh, why should a coach do it, and what did it mean to you? Well, what it means to me is in 2018, I set a goal that I will make the 35 under 35 list. So making the list this past November was a dream come true. And I'm appreciative of everyone that looked and took the time out of their day to look at my stuff. And that was a personal goal of mine for, for five years or four years, whatever it was when I got it. But the, it's, that was a dream come true and a fantastic experience. And I think it's fantastic for anyone to be inspired to do so because number one, you meet great guys like yourself, Coach Bryce, and you get that experience when you go to the convention and, ha- and meet those different people and you start to expand your network. I, I've built, a, I'd like to think I've built some friendships with some guys that were at the convention at the 3535 deal that, that maybe can help you get your next job. Maybe they help you kind of propel into working together, right? And all those different relationships. And I think that's what makes it so fantastic. And it's, I, I personally think it's an incredible thing to have on your resume and say that you've done to, to any a prospective hiring person or anything like that. And it's just, it's, it's really fantastic. And it, it's hard to come up with words because I'm so inspired and so thankful <laughs> that I finally made the list. You don't know when I, when I found out I made the list, I ran around the office in Calgary and I was going nuts and everyone was like, what's going on? What's going on? I'm like, I made 35 or 35 lists. I've been waiting so long. I've been waiting five years. So it, it's, it's really awesome. And I'm extremely thankful and any young coach or any any coach out there should should attempt to make a list and apply. 
Coach, I appreciate you uh, dropping dropping those lines there. Uh, before I let you go, though, man, I want you to uh, please drop your Twitter account. So if guys got questions, want to network, want to talk ball, want to talk about USFL, CFL, things like that, they can reach out to you and also just keep up with your career. Yeah, at TJ Vernieri. And my last name is spelled V-E-R-N-I-E-R-I. Go ahead and give me a follow. All right. We'll make sure to link that in the show notes and make it easy for everybody. Coach, thanks so much for your time. Uh, best of luck, and I look forward to forward to seeing you in nashville in 24 man absolutely thank you very much all right coach have a good one you too thanks for listening to this week's episode of inside the headset if you heard anything on this episode that you would like to learn more information about head over to afcapodcast.com where you can find every episode and all of the corresponding show notes while you're there take a second to rate review and subscribe to the podcast if you have any questions comments or suggestions for the show please let us know by sending an email to podcast at afca.com. Make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Inside the Headset and tag it when you share each episode. You can stay up to date with all things AFCA by following the at We Are AFCA Twitter account. Every episode of Inside the Headset can also be found on your favorite audio streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. If you are not currently a member of the AFCA, Be sure to find us online at AFCA.com and apply to join over 10,000 NFL, college, and high school coaches from around the country who are striving to be the best they can be. With an AFCA membership, you gain invaluable access to the annual AFCA convention, the bi-monthly magazine, and the new and improved digital library, which contains thousands of videos and articles contributed by hundreds of current and former football coaches. You can also visit AFCAinsider.com to sign up for our free weekly email newsletter on the right-hand side of the screen. It comes out every Tuesday at lunch and is filled with great articles and stories written by many of the same coaches you hear on the podcast. It's geared to help you become a better coach tomorrow than you are today. Be sure to connect with me on Twitter at Coach Mario Price. And remember, the AFCA is not just an annual convention. It is an association that continually promotes education, guidance, and networking. But it is also so much more than that. The AFCA is about celebrating the past and educating the future. It is about developing great coaches who will produce great teams and even better people. So invest in your skill set and impact today by engaging with the AFCA.